Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Ken Kaufman. Ken thrives as an executive in high growth organizations. In his current role as the CFO of Community Dental Partners since 2016, Ken has played an integral role in helping the company grow while building an entirely remote FP&A team and shoring up the accounting processes, systems, and teams to deliver on monthly closed deadlines, quarterly covenant and board reporting, annual tax and audit compliance, M&A support, and hands-on support to each member of the executive team. He is a sought-after speaker and thought leader in the dental industry and recently founded the Dental Finance Forum, the first mastermind of its kind that exclusively supports finance leaders of group practices and dental support organizations. He earned a business degree from BYU and MBA from University of Georgia in finance and entrepreneurship, where his peers selected him as the most outstanding student. He and his wife have been married for 23 years and have eight children. Ken enjoys serving in his church and uses whatever free time he can find to engage in cycling, mountain biking, and an occasional triathlon to keep himself humble. Ken, thank you very much for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, today we're going to be taking a look at your career and discussing some of the lessons you've learned along the way. And I'm looking forward to learning from your experience and sharing some of your tips with our audience. So let's get started. Sounds great. First, let's start with you. Tell me a bit about your career journey and how it is that you ended up where you are today. Sure. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. I did an undergraduate degree in business, and I actually started a business coming right out of college, and it failed miserably. And it was a great, amazing learning lesson. I then got involved with a really high-growth company that in about five years, we grew to almost $100 million in revenue. And I just found this passion for business and for finance, and that actually motivated me to go back and get an MBA in finance and entrepreneurship. And then... I'd been out of school a couple of years and I landed in my first CFO role. And that was in 2004. And then have just had opportunities, a period of time where I just did consulting. So I wasn't in one company. I was helping maybe five to 10 at a time. And then I went back into you know single company or an industry. And I've just primarily spent my time in lower middle market companies. Sounds like you've had a varied experience. Very interesting. There's something about growth, right? Just... When you're in high growth companies and when you're growth minded, those new opportunities, the opportunity to maybe jump to a different industry or jump to a different set of challenges, that's always kind of motivated me in what I've chosen to do with my career. Yeah. High growth companies are always an exciting place to be. That's right. I guess not for everybody, but for me also. So as you look back on your career, are there any particular stories that stand out in your mind as real turning points? Yeah, there are. I'll start with. The first one is in my first CFO role, and we exploded growth, meaning doubled revenue within a matter of months, not years, but months. And, you know, having taken finance classes and having learned how things are supposed to work and how the working capital and, you know, cash cycle works, I had never actually seen it in that intense of an environment where we doubled revenue within a few months. And I watched this amazing process happen where performance, we were just exploding. Our margins were going up. I mean, everything looked phenomenal, but cash was disappearing. And I had a business owner who was feeling extremely nervous about what was happening. I had others who were questioning and didn't understand that cash generally goes down when you're in that high growth mode, especially that fast. And it was just exhilarating to see how what I had learned about and studied and and had other sort of micro experience around at such a high velocity, you could see exactly how the working capital cycle works and what it takes for it to normalize out and why there's a short-term disappearance or investment of all that cash into working capital. And then ultimately, it all ends up great on the other side. And I had a business owner there who was so nervous and I was able to talk him down off the ledge. And ultimately, he made more money in that year than he had the prior 20 in owning the business with the amazing growth and with the way we kind of capitalized on the opportunities in the marketplace at the time. That was a real shift for me where I really saw how everything all came together in the entire cycle. Another one was 
because I spent a little period of my career, a little about five years doing consulting where I wasn't the CFO of the company on a full-time basis, but I was helping some lower middle market companies with some different challenges and things. And I decided actually, because one of them, their board approached me and asked me to come on board on a full-time basis. And it was just, it was the right time to do it. And it was just so fun to get so deep back into one company again. And that's just been how I've been in my career since then, as I just really love focusing on one company, getting deep and really, really helping drive growth and maximize value. Um, What did your stint as a consultant teach you? What were the important lessons that came out of those years? Uh, That's a great question. It's so powerful when you do the consulting because you get to look at multiple companies and multiple industries. And really quickly, I learned that 80 to 90% of what happens inside one industry is completely transferable to the other industry. But there's 10 to 20% that differs. And it was fun to jump into those nuances and learn those differences. And ultimately, I feel like it was a phenomenal education. And I can see why some people who, for example, go into accounting specifically and then go and work for a firm where they can work on multiple companies, it gives you so much experience and the breadth. And sometimes you can't get quite as deep, but the breadth of looking at all these different businesses, all these different industries, really, really powerful way to get an education very quickly. And so that was probably one of my favorite parts. And then obviously showing up to a brand new client and just diving in and figuring out what's going on. I always love the challenge of that. Yeah. So switching gears a bit, your current organization, Community Dental Partners, what is it that they do? So at Community Dental Partners, we are a dental support organization, which means we affiliate with dental practices and provide various non-clinical services to help the clinicians be as successful as possible in diagnosing and treating patients. And the doctors have the autonomy to do all of that, but they love being able to outsource and hand off a lot of those other functions. And so we are, like I said, we affiliate with, and we're a dental support organization. And as of today, or I should say by the end of the year, we'll be supporting about 70 dental practices throughout the U.S. Wow, I was just at the dentist this morning. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it was one that, that you support. How long have you been there? I have now been here for six years. Okay. And what are your proudest achievements since joining that organization? Oh, there are so many, but it's really hard for me to try to take the credit for myself because it is such a team effort in order to obviously build and grow an organization. I think what I'm probably the proudest is at the time that I joined the organization, we had we were just growing from seven locations supported, uh, breaking into the teens, and being able to say, here we are six years later, ending the year 2021, and we're to 70 locations. A 10x growth from seven to 70 is just, it's crazy. It's fun. There are some days where you wonder if you're going to make it. Other days where you feel like you can conquer the world, there's all those ups and downs through the process. Uh, but I'm just, I'm really, really proud of the team and the organization and thrilled for the fact that what this means is we're now supporting dentists that are seeing and treating and working with and making a difference and having an impact in the lives of hundreds of thousands of patients every year. It's really an incredible business to be in. And do you support dentist offices across the country or do you focus on a certain region? We do. We got our starts in the state of Texas, okay. and that is still where a majority of the practices are that we support, but we have expanded this year into a couple of new states and looking to continue to do more. And you touched on this a bit, and it also says this in your LinkedIn bio, but that you thrive as an executive in a high growth organization. So what aspects of working for fast growing company and industry excites you the most? Yeah, there are several here, and I'm certain I won't be able to name all of them as eloquently as I want. But the first one is is that in a high growth company, opportunities abound. That What I found when I was in the high growth company just shortly after trying to start my own business out of college and then then getting involved with a startup, what I found was is that if you show up, you work hard, you try to do a good job and be honest and try to make a difference, that you can find all sorts of opportunities because as the company's growing, they're going to continue to need help and they're looking for people that they can trust. And I was given probably way more responsibility and way more opportunity for growth than I'm certain I deserved 
just because I showed up and, and worked hard. And so the opportunities are just incredible in growth companies. That's one thing I love. Another thing is you just always get this exhilarating momentum from knowing that you're forging new ground, that you're pioneering into some new territory that hasn't been figured out yet. Also, you might think I'm a little crazy for this, Megan, but I do get energy when like, we build our company and grow to a point where we have to start breaking systems and processes and rebuilding them. And that's pretty energizing and exciting. And I think also there's this ongoing... Because when you're growing, it's just constantly trying to figure out how do we maximize the value we can bring to the customers so that they're willing to part with our hard-earned dollars. Or in the case they have insurance, they're willing to select our providers to provide care for them. And the third-party payers obviously are involved in the, at least some of the cash that changes hands, hands there. But figuring out how do, we, how do we bring more value? How do we do more? And the interesting thing in our business today is at Community Dental Partners is these clinicians are really our customers. So it's figuring out how can we support them as best as we can so that they can be as successful as possible treating their customers, which are the patients. And so all of these things kind of come together that just make working in in a startup, a a fast-growing company, just really fun. Yeah. I like your comment about breaking processes and fixing them. So how do you know when it's broken? And then how do you go about rebuilding it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll add this and I'll jump back to your question, but it's also about prioritizing which ones get fixed ahead of the other. Yeah. So that's sometimes the hardest, getting that right is the hardest thing to figure out. But generally we see systems breaking when all of a sudden employees are raising hands. Hey, I've got a question here. I've got a concern here. And I have a habit now, Megan, when I meet with my team, when I interact with anybody inside the organization, I like to ask the question of what are you the most concerned about? What are you worried about? What's currently frustrating you in your day-to-day role? And generally speaking, when I listen to their answers, that usually starts to point us to where something has broken or is about to break, and we've got to figure out a new process or system. And then, so once you've identified that it's broken, I'm always interested to find out how, like, what is the process for rebuilding? Okay. Yeah. So here's how we think about this inside of our organization. We believe there are three types of people in the world. The people who make it up, the people who make it real, and then the people who make and keep it recurring. And the make it up people are generally your executives, your directors, your leaders inside the organization. And then you obviously have a lot of employees that are taking on tasks that are recurring in nature. And that middle group that I mentioned, the people who make it real and turn it into a recurring process that say a 12 or a 15 or a $20 an hour employee would be executing on, those are project managers and project coordinators. And so we've built out a project management organization inside of our company that allows us to, when we see that something needs to change, it first of all allows us to identify what are the projects or the key areas that we want to start to change. And then through the project management process or through the team that's in charge of making it real, we go through identifying what the impact is going to be of the changes that are needed. How do we prioritize each one relative to each other and get the entire project list turned into a set of what we call playbook projects that we renew every year and say, okay, these are the things that we are going to dedicate all of this project management time and energy toward with the leadership team supporting and then with obviously going to what's called Gemba or you know, going to where those reoccurring employees are at and working with them to make sure that we're going to bring them something, not that you know, in the ivory tower somewhere, somebody thought was a great idea, but wouldn't work in practice, but actually turning it into you know, something that really is going to you know, have the impact that it needs to, whether it was a broken system that now is getting fixed and updated, or it's a completely new system because we've just completely you know, transcended anything that existed before and we're taking things to an entirely new level. Does that help with the, that explanation help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that additional detail. And not too long ago on LinkedIn, you were offering a $3,000 referral bonus to your circle within LinkedIn for new hires. So tell me like a little bit about what went into that decision to do that and how that worked out. Because I know every organization in the United States right now is struggling to find talent? Yeah, that's a great question. And it definitely is extremely relevant in today's market. So what happened was about the end of last year, 
when I looked at what was coming up and the challenges that we had to take on, I realized that my FP&A team was very underdeveloped and understaffed relative to what I was going to need to support the business moving forward. And so we started on a journey where we brought in a director of FP&A, and then we started to look at our current staff and their skill set relative to what we needed. And with this director, started to build up the right FP&A organization. And it's kind of interesting. He just passed, this director just passed his one-year mark. And when I listed that position, it was because we had finally kind of gotten through several pieces of building this department. And we got really clear on what we needed, which by the way, great hiring always starts with being massively clear about exactly what it is that you need from the position. And it comes from a skill set matched up with obviously what their job duties and their responsibilities are going to be on a day-to-day basis, but also culture. And we can jump into that to whatever degree you want to. But when we posted this position, we were at a point in time where we needed to make several hires. And I knew that with the market being the way it was, we were going to need to probably do something a little bit unique or different. And so that's why we made the offer of the $3,000 signing bonus. And we do have one person that, that earned it. So there was somebody that was referred. It was actually a family member. And we hired that individual because they were just a fantastic candidate for the role. And I, you know, spending that $3,000 was one of the best things we've ever yeah. done. We found a phenomenal employee and already had a family member that had, quote unquote, you know, drunk from the Kool-Aid in terms of really like our company and like how we do things. And so that was a huge success. Yeah, those referrals I find are often some of the best employees. They are. And the interesting thing about it is when we first did that, I mentioned it to our HR team and then they didn't send it out to the company. I uh, mean, you know, we published it out on LinkedIn and other places. And I said, hey, why aren't we sending this with you know, our, our regular newsletter that goes to the employees when we let them know what positions are open? And they said, well, you know, Nobody else in the company except for your departments can really focus on finance and those sorts of things. And we didn't think anybody would be interested. And I said, okay, your point is true, but they have relatives. They have friends that are in finance and that live in this world. And so they resent it out. In any ways, grateful they did because we ended up finding a great employee from it. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about this a bit, but Community Dental Partners is incredibly fast growing. So When you're hiring, how do you make sure that you find the best talent for each role? You mentioned having a clear description of what's needed, but in some of the new roles, maybe it's kind of gray or not clear what exactly will be needed yet. Yeah, Megan, you're so intuitive here. Your question is brilliant. And I need to start by just saying a lot of times we get it wrong. In a growing company, you really try to anticipate but then sometimes things shift and change and what you anticipated becomes completely different. That's one issue. So you may come up with this great job description, but then it turns out you know, two months after you hire them, you need them doing a whole bunch of different things that weren't ever in that job description. The second part of it, we just have to own is sometimes we're creating a position that's never existed before inside of our organization. And when we look around as a leadership team, we say, we've actually never even hired somebody to do something like this before. And so we often don't know because we don't have a lot of experience on how to get the right person hired for that specific role. I'll give you an example. At some point, our company is going to get big enough, and we think it's sometime soon, where we're just going to need to hire an in-house general counsel. And I've done it once in my career, and nobody else on the leadership team has done that before. And so how do we make sure we get that right? And we we're clear on the position and then we're clear on the type of person we need and how they want to feel motivated, obviously, to be successful in the role. And so sometimes we just missed. And we like to say in our organization, there's only two outcomes. We either get it right or we learn. And sometimes the first hire just we miss and, and they miss too in terms of getting the right fit because we just don't have all the experience. So I think I have to own both of those. In a startup company, both of them are hard. It's getting that job description right and having that stay stable to the person you're hiring, but then also knowing sometimes we're creating new positions that are new to us. And we sometimes make mistakes on who we hire. Um, I hate to say that. When we do make mistakes, we do the best we can to repurpose them because right high growth, usually there's other opportunities. It does sometimes cause frustration on both sides. Sometimes people end up exiting the organization, but that generally when you're in high growth, 
it's usually about people saying, yeah, no, I don't really want to be a part of this. I want to you know, go take my time and services and, and use them elsewhere. And of course, we always wish them the best on the way and, and hope the best for all of them. Does that, I don't know that I answered the question. No, that's great. But I, that, that's, I want to put that there so you can ask me any follow-up questions. Yeah, no, no, no. That's definitely great. And yeah, I'm sure when it's not a fit, like it's felt both ways from the employee and from you guys. And uh, it's great. Like you said, high growth, you're able to repurpose a lot, but sometimes we just have to admit mistakes and move on. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't in good conscience show up and say that we get it right all the time because <laughs> we don't, but we're learning in the process and we're getting better and better all along the way. You're a hundred percent remote CFO. I'm sure not unlike a lot of companies these days. So talk to me about running a remote finance team and how you keep your employees engaged and semblance of a culture. Yeah. So when you say hundred percent remote, I do travel on site to where our support center is located but not that often. So I'm mostly remote. There are a couple of tricks to this that we found. And it's been a little bit of a journey to learn this and try to figure it out and try to get it right. So if I jump back three, four years ago, maybe five years ago, my FP&A manager needed to move about five hours south from our support center, just for some family reasons. And it was a good thing for him. And Initially, he found another job and I went and found a replacement for him, but kept him on part-time just to help out with projects and help train the new person. He was willing to do all that. And after a couple months, he said, hey, I'm not really liking my new job. And I said, hey, I'm not really liking the hire I made. <laughs> what do you say we try to get back together? And he's, he was really concerned about, well, you know, I'm not going to be there on site. What am I going to miss out on? And how about I, I travel every six weeks? I'll come up on site. And so we figured out an arrangement. And after about six months of this, he's like, I don't really need to come anymore. I've realized I can just do everything I need to from home. And he and I had gotten into a really nice rhythm and cadence. And that was the first stage of me starting to realize, hey, maybe there's a way to do things remotely. Then the need for my family to move came up about a year after we had gone through this experiment with my FP&A manager. And I ended up moving out of state. And figured out how to do it all remote. And then all of a sudden, when we needed to add some new positions to our FP&A team or to the accounting team, I started to say, why do board... Actually, borders don't have to be boundaries anymore for us. Why wouldn't we look and consider just finding the best talent wherever they're at and allowing them to work remote, which then allowed us to start thinking about offshore. And so we ended up... We've ended up with a nice blend, I think, of hiring people that are local to our support center hiring people just in other areas in the United States, and then hiring offshore. We now have... My accounting and finance teams are now covering three continents because we've been able to allow our minds to be expanded and opened up to what's possible if 30 to 45-minute driving radius around our support center is no longer a boundary for us. Yeah, that's really eye-opening for a lot of people that not everybody does have to be on site. And it was good that you guys figured that out before COVID hit. But realizing that you can I want to mention this, Megan. What I found is there is a little bit still, like, so I've been doing this for a few years now, and and there's still a little bit of mess with the team when some or all of them are remote. And so what I've realized, and I've been experimenting with this, but I think I'm honing in on what's needed. I'm doing a two to three day summit with each, with my fp and team, and then with my accounting team separately once a year. Yeah. And that, that means we bring them all in, even those from offshore, if we can arrange the travel and things, we bring them all in and we do two to three days of personal development, team building and development, and some other training. And, and we just, and we have some fun. We always work a really cool community-based service project into it. And it's, that's kind of closed that final gap to where it, the team really coalesces even better once they do that. And once they know, hey, once a year, we're all going to be face-to-face and and connecting and continuing to build our team. Does that make sense? Definitely. I think that's a brilliant idea. Has that model worked with like brand new hires out of college? I'm always interested in like, how do you you incorporate someone who's brand new into the workforce in a remote kind of an environment? Yeah, it really comes down to, and, and the way we found success with this is, it is either the director or manager spending a lot of just open Zoom time with them to be 
sometimes they're not even talking to each other. They're just parallel working. Uh But that new employee knows, hey, I can just ask a question as if I'm sitting the next desk over. (laughs) It's just you're on Zoom together. So it's a lot of that. And we did have some success when we were hiring over the summer. We did hire somebody, amazing person, straight out of school, though, with very little real world uh, experience in finance. And that's what our FP&A manager has done is just spent a lot of open Zoom time answering questions, working through things. And he has progressed really nicely. And I think if you were on this podcast with us, he'd probably tell you he's thrilled with his choice and feels like he's learned a ton in the last six months since he joined our, our organization. Yeah, that's awesome. And so realizing that the world is now open up to finding employees and executing on that I guess this is probably somewhat challenging. How did you first go about offshoring some of your workforce? I really appreciate this question. So the way that we approached it was we met a group that had some connections and was building up an organization in Africa, the country of Zimbabwe specifically. And they were talking about the talent there. They speak the Queen's English. They're very well educated. And we said, hey, why don't we just give this a try for a couple of, you know, more of the entry level positions and let's see how this works. And actually our RCM, our revenue cycle management team made some of the first hires for kind of an entry level billing or biller type of a position. And we, that was our barely dipping our toe in the water right at first. And then we found that it worked pretty good. The technology seemed to the latency wasn't really existent. So we were able to real time keep up with everything. There wasn't a lag. And we just continued to move on to where I ended up hiring a controller from Africa, from Zimbabwe. And then we started to make some direct relationships. We actually went over and visited because I wanted to learn and put my hands on it, so to speak, of how it all works and how the structure worked. And so that was very eye-opening to travel there and meet these people face-to-face and meet their families and and engage with them, as well as work through time zone differences and those sorts of things uh, and understand what the challenges are related to that. That was our very first foray. And then we've made some direct relationships in uh, the Philippines, in other places in Africa. And we also have done a little bit of hiring for Mexico. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so let's switch gears a bit. And we've touched on this a bit, but growth investments are critical, particularly for high growth companies. But of course, when you're making those investments, they're driving down your EBITDA. You've been able to convince lenders to give you a credit for some of your growth investments and add that back to EBITDA. So what are some of your tips and tricks for accomplishing this? Yeah, I I love this question. And it's so relevant. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have with other finance folks around this topic. And I've become fairly passionate about it. I'm not going to say an expert, but definitely passionate for trying to figure it out and learn it and talk to others about it and brainstorm. So here's the basic premise. When you look around your industry, whatever industry you're in, and people have expectations, they say, hey, the EBITDA margin should be at 7%, 10%, 15%, whatever it is. Understanding that... And understanding the the model in your industry, and then looking at your OPEX and saying, if I break my OPEX into two buckets, and if I have one bucket that's called maintenance, and the purpose of the maintenance bucket is I put all employee costs, vendor costs, everything goes into that bucket from my OPEX that it would take to just run the business. If I stopped all my growth initiatives, if I stopped trying to be acquisitive or open new locations or you know whatever the business model is, if I was to just go to steady state on this business and maintain, what are the costs to accomplish that? And so you peel out all of the growth stuff and then you look and you say, okay, if I just had that OPEX, what would my margin be? And then you can start to learn and you can get really comfortable with explaining to anybody internally or externally Hey, we would be at that 7% or that 12% or 15% EBITDA margin, whatever it is, we would be there because this is what it takes to run the business. This is the OPEX. And that gets me right to that margin. Everything else we're doing is, and I can use lots of terms here. It's a growth investment. It's an R&D investment, right? I can go down. There are lots of things to call this other bucket, but knowing that, and we even within our accounting system, we've chosen to create 
buckets for OpEx so that on GNA side, we can see exactly from general administrative costs, how much is going toward maintenance and how much is going toward growth. And when we do our variance meetings, sorry, I'm kind of rambling here, but there's yeah. a lot to unpack. But the, we also, the monthly variance meetings with the business leaders, we always go through their maintenance versus growth OpEx. And that gives us the opportunity them to continue to update us and the opportunity for us to continue to understand is that person or is that cost being used to sustain the existing or maintain the existing business or is it being directed toward growth activities and growth initiatives? So I'll, I'll stop there, Megan. And if you want to unpack that further, I'm happy to do it. No, I think that's brilliant that you've broken them down into two buckets that can be examined separately. And I'm sure it has to be a, a balancing act for a lot of companies that are trying to grow and trying to look good to lenders and investors. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's a brilliant idea of how to convince someone that the money you're spending and driving down EBITDA is actually for future growth. That's right. And another thing I'll add on, you know, we, we live in a world of the five-year model. We all want to have an updated five-year model so we can look and see where are things going and where are we going to get to. And my strategy specifically when I'm talking to ec potential equity partners is when we're discussing the five-year plan, I want to show them two versions of it. I want to show them the version that, say, year two or three, we start to peel back the growth investment side, the, you know, the growth, the EBITDA that's being expensed out for growth. And I want to show them, hey, if we were to go into maintenance mode here, this is where the business gets to. And then, and this also helps you identify what really is your growth potential and what is your growth engine really worth. But then I want to show them in the second version of the model, all right, if I don't get rid of that growth investment and it does depress EBITDA, where will we be at the end of that fifth year relative to at the end of year five when you cut those costs like around year two or year three and you just kind of lean the business out and go into that maintenance mode? And you really know you've got a great growth business and a great growth story if you can show them, look, keeping this growth investment is actually going to improve or it'll be better than the other model if at the end of five years, because the other model, right, the, the one that is focused on the going into maintenance mode, it'll have be up to a certain EBITDA and a certain value, but your growth will have slowed. But in the other one where you keep that growth cost in, that growth OPEX, at the end of that fifth year, you can show them, look, your equity value is going to be more. If you say, hey, let's keep that growth OPEX, let's not lean this business out and prepare it to sell in some reason, let's just keep on the growth trajectory. That's when you know you've got a great growth business and, and you've got a great story to be able to tell that people can buy into and really believe in. That's from an equity perspective. And then obviously the lenders will follow suit. How do you convince them that it's not just a pipe dream, that, that those investments are actually going to pan out as you expect they will? Yeah, that's a very fair question. Um, we, to the degree you have documented proof that you've been able to do it so far uh -huh. and that you're uh, reasonably, or, and that your growth plans are reasonably based in assumptions that should be able to be comparable to your past performance, that tends to buy a lot of credibility. Yeah. So lastly, as a CFO, what is keeping you up at night these days? What's keeping me up at night? That's a great question. There are actually lots of possible answers to this. Inflation is one, the rise of virtual currencies and the stability of the dollar in general, yeah. a soft labor market, COVID variants, and the continuing changes in regulatory and compliance requirements. I mean, that's what's happening now is just insane with what business leaders are having to react to and implement. But actually, I'm not going to say any of those to answer this. Here's what is keeping me up at night. Can I figure out how to become the best leader possible for the business? And where am I missing? What do I need to be changing about my mindset? about my view, about the way I'm approaching things, about the way I'm leading my teams, about the way I'm interacting with the business leaders and, and our external and internal stakeholders. I actually just, the thing I'm the most worried about is, can I be that person? And what do I need to be doing to get myself to the next level and continue to grow? Because if you're in a growth company, you have to grow if you want to keep up individually as a person, as somebody working inside that business. I'd say that's what I worry about the most, actually, is how am I going to be that person and how can I improve myself? Yeah, I love that answer. I mean, there's so much in the world that we can't control, but that is actually one thing that we can control is transforming ourselves 
and growing and uh, continuing to be successful in whatever it is that we're doing. Yeah, that's right. Couldn't agree more. Ken, thank you so much for being my guest today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, Megan, to spend this time with you. Yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about your experiences and all of the resulting insights. And I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And I wish you and Community Dental Partners all the best. Thank you so much. And of course, all the best to you. And I'm hoping for great success for your podcast on a community basis. Thank you very much. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personive.com. Thanks for listening.